all I have to say is stay till the part where they find these green buildings because once they find these green buildings it reveals everything and it's horrifying but before we begin if true crime stories and trees your interest then I would highly suggest you subscribe to my youtube channel as that's all I do and I upload once a week and also a massive shout out to all 480 of you guys it really means a lot but with all that being said let's begin One of our main characters in today's video is 29-year-old Johnny Cox and his wife, 25-year-old Megan Cox. And even though when it came to their love and their relationship, it was really strong, but when it came to resisting drugs and just the overall drug life, even their love couldn't help them resist it. And so right from the get-go, life was pretty rough on them. And since slowly but surely their drug habits got worse and worse and more frequent to be more exact, they would find themselves eventually homeless and in the streets begging for money and again going back to the point where they relied on drugs so much they couldn't even get a stable job or in some cases when they did get a stable job they wouldn't be able to keep it and this would be bad but it gets worse the fact is that the couple had a kid and of course as i just described they were in no shape or form to actually look after the kid and so in december 2015 child protective services would step in and would just tell the couple that look you guys aren't clearly well enough to look after this child so unfortunately we're gonna have to take them away from you and well you think they've hit rock bottom but it gets worse unfortunately just a couple of days later, the married couple would get arrested due to the fact that they committed variable offences that were from their drug habits. Now sitting in a cell looking face first into a brick wall, Johnny and Megan knew that they needed to turn their life around. Not just for them, forget about them, it was for their child. Because where they were in their life, it was just rock bottom. Not only could they not see the child, but they couldn't even walk freely anymore. So the two would spend some time in jail before ultimately being let out. As things were starting to turn around for the couple, they would get this once in a lifetime chance from someone that Megan knew of. And this man was a very successful real estate investor. And his name was Todd Kelly. Excuse me if I butcher his second name. And the way him and Megan met was when Megan was a waitress at a local diner. Well, she would serve them all the time until they exchanged numbers. But I know some of you might be getting more ideas, but it was it from there. Nothing else happened. And so Todd would reach out to Megan and would say that, Hey, I know you're going through some stuff. And well, just to help you out, I tell you what, I've got a job offer for you. And not only you, your husband as well can work for me. And well, when Johnny and Megan heard this news, they were ecstatic. And the best part was, they also were told that they were going to get paid pretty well. And the main reason why Todd wanted these two, or just wanted workers in general, was because recently, Todd had purchased a massive 95 acre plot of land near the area where Johnny and Megan were. And well, he needed people to clean the property for him. Because even though the land was massive, it hadn't really been touched in a while. And Todd had plans to develop this property. So again, he reached out to Megan, who was struggling for money. And of course, let's be honest, we all knew that they were going to say yes, because they were desperate for money. And the fact that these two, a couple of months ago, were not even looked as potential candidates for work, somehow got a job that would pay them a lot of cash. This was something that felt too good to be true. And later on, you'll know why. Now, the day is December 19th of the same year, and it's the couple's first day of the job. And so on that day, Megan would wake up, go downstairs, and would tell her mother all about this job. And all her mother could do was just smile because she knew how much this job meant to her daughter. Because not only for the money, it was the fact that she's finally changing her life around and actually putting her life back together. So after a nice conversation with her mother, Johnny and Megan would head out and would begin to head towards the property. The property itself, again, wasn't too far away from Megan and Johnny, so they would arrive pretty quickly. And right as they got in front of the main entrance of this property, they would be met with a fence with chains around it. And what was behind that fence seemed like a massive forest. And well, this was the 95 acre land that Todd had bought. And in the center of this land was a couple of buildings, which where Megan and Johnny needed to go because they were responsible for cleaning that area up. And so Megan would follow this chain fence until there was a gap where she could fit a car through. When I mean gap, it's probably more for entrance was the best way to describe it. And so they would drive through and would find themselves just going through a forest basically. And not long they would find themselves driving deep into the heart of the forest. And the couple at this point were in awe, just staring all around the place because they couldn't fathom how someone could have this much money and buy this much land. Now for this story to have the what the heck effect, we're gonna have to skip a couple of days, specifically three days. And Megan's mother at this point had no contact with Megan for the last three days. And at first she was worried, but she kind of told herself that Megan must be busy. And even though she never got told, he thought that Megan must be staying over there 
because it was a big job. And so on the third day, Megan's mother was pretty intrigued on what her daughter was doing. And so she decided to ring her daughter. Her daughter didn't pick up and so she waited an hour or two before ultimately ringing her again but again she didn't pick up and even though she was a bit worried she wasn't that worried she just told herself again that she must be busy but eventually when her busyness stopped she should call back but a couple of more hours later would go by and still no call from megan so now megan's mother's worried me has getting bigger and bigger to the point where he would actually try to call Johnny, but again, Johnny wouldn't answer. So now Megan's mother's trying her best not to overreact as she's walking up and down her hallway. And pretty quickly, trying not to overreact goes out the window. As she begins to think of the worst possible outcomes, which mainly was the couple had relapsed and overdosed. And so after a couple of minutes of thinking, she would just drop everything and rush to Megan and Johnny's small house, where she wouldn't find the couple or any sign that the couple had been there over the last couple of days. Now a good feeling is screaming at her that something isn't right for them to go completely off grid and not tell her about anything makes no sense whatsoever and with only one option left she decides to call the police but due to the couple's past the police didn't really take it seriously and would just tell megan's mother that they'll just turn up a couple of days just give them some time but megan's mother was adamant that this was something more than that and it can actually be very fateful and this was enough to convince the police to start actually investigating the police would start this investigation by asking the owners of the property that the two said they were going to work in. And of course, you know, that man was Todd. And since he was the owner of the property, and he was probably the last person to see them before they ultimately vanished. And at first, Todd was a bit defensive and would tell the police saying that I have no idea where they went. But when the police kept pushing Todd for more answers, he would just snap. I would just start shouting saying I have no idea what happened to but eventually he would quickly calm down and would apologize to the police as he doesn't like being accused. He would go on to say that I had limited interactions with them. He would also go on to say that when they arrived on my property, all they did was clean my property as I asked them to do. And once they cleaned my property, I paid them and they went. And since then, we haven't been in contact. And so the police, even though they were very suspicious on the way Todd was acting, would just decide to wait it out and see if the couple would reappear from what they thought was most likely another relapse that they ultimately went through with the money that they made. And to be fair, that was their only option as they couldn't do anything else. So a couple of more days would go by ever since that talk with Todd unfortunately the couple would not return to their home and still no one had no idea on where these two could be and things would stay the same for a couple of weeks a couple of months and at this point the case was becoming more colder and colder by the day but something would change on august 31st 2016 the whole eight months after their disappearance there were two more people in the local area that went missing and these two were a couple one of their names was kayla brown who was a 30 year old woman and her boyfriend 32 year old charlie Carver. And even though these two are a couple, they haven't really been dating for them. But it wouldn't really stop them from becoming very serious with each other. Because Charlie, even though their relationship was in the early stages, he would introduce Kayla to his family. Which for Charlie was a big achievement. But unlike the other couple, the Coxies, these two were nowhere near in the financial difficulties that they were going through. Charlie had a full-time job operating a printer at a local business. Kayla made a living by doing odd jobs around the town. And to their families, it seemed like they were very happy in the direction that they were going in life. And it just felt like nothing could go wrong in their lives. But if you watch my videos for long enough, you do know that something does go wrong. And it starts on the August 31st, when Kayla and Charlie stop returning messages or answering their phone calls. Everyone on both families were worried. But it would be Charlie's father who was extremely worried as he and his son Charlie were very close with each other and Charlie's father knew that if Charlie didn't answer his phone he could always expect Charlie to phone him back later when he was free but Charlie never and for that reason Charlie's father was extremely worried because this was something so out of character for Charlie and this would also give the fact that whatever was going on with Charlie wasn't good at all but even though with that state of mind he remained optimistic that he would get a phone call or even a text message at least but the next couple of days would go by and still charlie's father would not get a phone call or even a text message and again this was the same for kayla as well and charlie's father was so worried to the point that he actually would go to charlie's house to actually see if charlie was in their house and when he got there he saw the house was all turned off and overall gave him the vibe that no one had been living there for the last couple of days and while charlie's father wouldn't stop there he would drive to kayla's house the same went for Kayla as well. She wasn't there and the house looked like no one had been living there for the last couple of days. With literally no idea on what to do, Charlie's father decided that I'm going to have to call the police. 
and so that's exactly what he did and the police were involved. The police at first had no idea where to start since they had no leads due to the sudden disappearance but they would finally start by interviewing Charlie and Kayla's friends and family but everyone would have the same answer they had no idea where they went. At first when Kayla and Charlie's friends got told that they were missing they told the police that they thought the couple were going on a trip or a holiday but again when the police told them that they were missing they began to get really worried and well unfortunately for the next two months nothing would happen as the police had no idea what to do or where to look but just as everyone was beginning to lose hope on where these two went the police would finally get a search warrant that would allow them to look at their respective phone call records so to start with they would check Kayla's phone and they were able to locate roughly where her last location was and well from the pings that her phone was given off from a nearby phone tower the police discovered that it was in the same 95 acres of land that the Coxies had been in before they went missing. With no hesitation the police put a search warrant to go search this land. So as they waited for this search warrant to be cleared the police would send out a team to the entrance of this land where the Coxies went through. So as soon as the warrant gets cleared they can just bust through but for some reason this warrant was taking a while to get cleared. So another set of officers would go to the owner of this land, Todd's house, which at the time was about 20 minutes away from the actual property. And so the police would arrive at the front door, knock on it. As soon as he opened the front door, his face was shocked because he was not expecting the police at his front door. So the police would lay everything down, would just tell Todd everything that they found. And Todd knew that this looked unbelievably suspicious. For a couple to go into his property and just vanish all of a sudden made Todd look very bad, which he knew. But he would calmly say, I know how this looks, but trust me when I say this I have no idea where they went. I hired Kayla and her boyfriend came along. They both went onto my property to do some cleaning for me and as soon as they were done with their job I paid them and they left. That's all the interactions that we had. So the fact that her last known location is inside my property I have no idea and I have nothing to tell you because I just don't know. And it was at this point the police officers outside of Todd's land got their search warrant cleared and so they would head inside to this property and they would make their way to the last known location of Kayla and it wasn't long before they found a clearing and so they began to drive forward into this clearing as the trees on the side became closer and closer. When they got to this clearing they noticed that there was two green buildings. The left of these buildings looked kind of like a shed that specifically you would keep your tools in but the right of this shed was a massive green container that had all these metal chains wrapped around it on top of that five padlocks to keep the door shut. And I know what you're thinking you're presuming that Kayla's in there which was also the police's thought. But before they opened the big container they went into the shed to see if there was anything there which unfortunately wasn't the case. All there was inside was just gardening tools. So that left that big container which again was wrapped around with metal chains. The police knew that they needed to bring heavy equipment so they brought out their metal cutting saw and also their bolt cutters and so they began to cut into these bolts and chains and finally when they opened the door up they were gobsmacked on what they saw. Watch out, y'all move. <laughs> I got it, watch out. Hey, Joey. Joey. Sheriff's office. Sheriff's office. I need what? Grab that Back up, everybody. Yes, what? Are you okay? Grab what? Go. Do you have any weapons? Coming through, okay? What's your name? What's your name? Right here. Lauren. Lauren. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just How a girl. are you, honey? This is, this, cutters. this is our best friend. He's a pyramid. The police had finally found Kayla and she was in rough shape. She was also bound with metal chains wrapped around her neck and her mouth, which those chains were anchored to the wall. Also, she was handcuffed, but thankfully still alive. And when eventually the police finally freed her from this container, she would tell them everything that happened, which starts on August 31st, 2016. So the same day Charlie's father would notice that he wasn't getting any responses from his son. That day Kayla would receive a text from one of her good friends, Todd. And just like the Coxies, he would ask her that. Hey, I was looking for some people to come out to my new property that I've just bought. Because I'm looking to clean it and get it ready for development. And Kayla, who was looking for some work, would agree to it. And once their conversation was done, she would tell Charlie all about this new job. And once Charlie heard about this, he would ask Kayla, can I come along? And at first Kayla said no, because he's not going to pay you. But then Charlie said he doesn't even need to pay me. And so Kayla totally thrilled, said yes, you need to come along with me then. And this would be good for spending time with each other. 
and also making some money. So later that day, she and Charlie would head out to the property and they would reach to the entrance of the property and they would just drive through. And again, they would drive through this long access road all the way until they got to the clearing. And once they got to the clearing, they could see Todd who was just standing there waving at them. And when the couple got out of the car, they saw Todd just standing there in front of these green buildings. And so now the couple parked up and began to walk towards Todd to greet him. And as they were walking towards Todd, it wouldn't be long before Todd would just whip out a pistol and shoot Charlie three times in the chest. And as soon as Charlie fell to the ground, Todd would point the gun at Kayla and would menacingly just tell her that if you go anywhere or try anything, I'll kill you. And not just you either, I'll kill your entire family. And then he proceeded to put the gun away and would walk over to Charlie's lifeless body and would wrap him in blue top and then would carry him and dump him in a nearby bucket of tractor. Once he was done with that, he would walk back to Kayla, who was just standing there in disbelief on what was going on and also so terrified that she couldn't even move either if she wanted to and once he got close enough he would pull out his gun once again and ordered Kayla to go inside the shipping container and so with no option left Kayla would do as she was told she would go inside and once she was inside Todd would lock her up that's how it was for the next 65 days Kayla had essentially just become into a prisoner Todd would come once or twice a day and would just do whatever he wanted to Kayla and told her every time that if she tries to resist he'll kill her entire family so Kayla thinking about her family wouldn't try anything and just kind of accepted that this is her life and she knew that once Todd was sick of her he was just gonna kill her anyway but at least her family was gonna be safe but when that day came when the police busted through the property and opened the container Kayla couldn't believe it because Kayla well and truly believed that she was gonna die in that container when Kayla explained everything to the police a radio got sent out to the other squad that was interviewing Todd and obviously in that radio everything was told about what they found and they were told also to arrest Todd obviously when Todd found out that Kayla was found and also the fact that she told the truth of what happened his face said a thousand different words but thankfully there's a video of it we have Kayla in your property she was locked in a container okay she has told us that you shot and killed Charlie why did you shoot him I didn't shoot anybody sir okay why did you lock her in a container in your property She's on your property right now, locked in a container. She's saying you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the convict box or anything? No, sir. I'm money that turn. Probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back here. Todd, surprisingly, despite the overwhelming evidence against him, would still deny this fact. But eventually he would confess not just kidnapping Kayla, but also killing three people, which were Johnny and Megan Coxie and also Kayla's boyfriend. And he would go on to say that with Johnny and Megan, he would do the same strategy as he did with Kayla. He would lure the Coxies into his property on the promise of work. And when they reached these green buildings, he would pull out a gun and would shoot Johnny. And just like Kayla, he would order Megan to go into the shipping container. But the difference was with Megan. Unlike Kayla, Megan would actually try to run away from Dodd. And once she finally got captured again, she would resist Todd and would just do everything that Todd didn't want which in about five days Todd would have enough and would just kill her. Todd would go on to describe Megan as a wild animal and he would say that I had to put a bullet in that wild animal and the tone that he said these words in was so casual like he just didn't care or he just didn't understand he just took people's lives away from them. A bit more searching later, the police would find Megan and Johnny's body. Their bodies would be discovered in shallow graves that were made for them, right outside the shipping container. At this rate, Todd knew that he was going to receive the death penalty. So in a last ditch effort to escape this fate, he would confess to even more murders. And if he confessed to these murders, the police would take away the death penalty from him, which obviously they agreed to. And so Todd would go on to say in 2003, he had walked into this motorbike shop and killed four of their staff members. They were apparently a couple of days earlier, they had offended him in some way. It is believed all they were doing was joking around with him by saying Todd's motorbike skills wasn't good enough. And of course, to me and you, this is just a light joke, but Todd didn't see it like that. And in fact, that light joke got him very offended. To the point in open broad daylight, he would shoot all four of them dead. And the worst part was when he was telling the story to the police, he seemed pretty proud. And also he would go on to brag about the way he killed these people. It was almost like he was some sort of professional hitman. Now, even though these murders were enough for the police to take away the death penalty away from Todd, the police believed that Todd had killed more people. And while during her captivity and the fact that Todd was so confident that Kayla wasn't getting out, he told Kayla that he had a killing streak going on. 
and how his body count was in the high double digits. But since he didn't need to tell the police that, he didn't. And so we don't really know if he actually did kill that many people or he didn't. But let's be honest, he probably did. Another disturbing and quite well known fact is, when Todd was announced to the world as a killer, an anonymous account was doing all these product reviews on Amazon. And this anonymous account was Todd. And the products that he was reviewing were things like knives, shovels, chainsaws. And the reviews were talking about how he was going to use these products to kill people. Or how he was going to use these products to dispose of bodies. Todd would ultimately get sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences. Which practically means he'd spend the rest of his life in prison. And thus was the story of Todd, also known as the Amazon Review Killer. So that'll be it for today's video. If true crime stories and intrigues your interest, then I highly suggest you subscribe to my YouTube channel, as that's all I do and I upload once a week. But with all that being said, thank you for watching, and yeah, goodbye.